So yeah, so I think that, I mean, when we were thinking about micro productivity many years ago, uh, we didn't necessarily think of it in the context of, well, we will be in a situation where we are interleaving various parts of our lives. And so I think that I wanted to bring that thought a bit, a little bit, and then just re refocus our attention on, okay, so what does micro productivity mean in the current way of how we're working? Uh, so I wanted to first start off with acknowledging the amazing team of people that I had had the fortune of working with. And so the top two rows are my colleagues, uh, mostly in MSR uh, and some, some in academia. And the bottom two rows are the interns that we had the, the pleasure of working with uh, during the summer months. And so many of the projects that I will discuss today or touch upon today are direct contributions from the interns. We, were not, we would not have been able to move so much, so fast in this area without the help of our interns. And many of them have graduated, they are faculty members in different places or are, or are researchers in industry. And so we are very proud to see where they have gone. So uh, the motivation behind this work is that, well, the traditional way that we think of doing something is that we want to set aside time, we want to focus and get things done. But the fact of the matter is that, well, user attention is fragmented and it's fragmented even more now. And there are so many things that are pulling your attention in different directions. And this is part of the reason is that human beings are kind of wired that way, is that we do multiple things at the same time because we are oftentimes we're able to. So we walk and talk at the same time. That's something that we can do naturally. Uh, but we also sometimes overestimate the type of things that we can do simultaneously. And that's where the challenges in attention management comes, is that, well, we, 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 maybe we are dividing our attention to so much that we are really not able to do any one thing in a really good way. Uh, we also often struggle to figure out what task we should be directing our attention to. So finding the right thing to do at the right moment. Uh, sometimes we have difficulties in prioritizing, uh, sometimes we uh, have difficulties in kind of like, even if we do something else, there's something else at the back of our mind that is, that is eating away at our attention. So what fragmentation of attention means that we have many micro moments during our days. And so think about situations where you're in the middle of transitions. And so you have these like small moments where typically we don't use them for anything useful. Uh, you could imagine that, well, this is what people might do. And this is not certainly what we are recommending that people do. Uh, but think about you are waiting in front of an elevator or you're waiting in front of the cafeteria where when you, back in the days when you used to go to the cafeteria to get food, or you're meeting, you're waiting in a meeting room uh, for a meeting to start, or in the current day, you're waiting in a Zoom call, waiting for the presenter to show up. Uh, so there are these micro moments that are kind of like not necessarily planned. They're small. They're not something that you would imagine would be useful to do something substantial. Uh, but if you take those micro moments and you kind of like defrag them and then you get a substantial amount of time. And so our idea was that, well, is there a way that we can actually uh, start using these micro moments in a way that instead of playing games, we, we can start doing little bits and pieces of tasks so that the micro moments actually become something useful. So the other thing is that I would like to introduce you to the new normal. No one needs an introduction because that's what our current life is. So most people are now working at home amidst other people who are cohabiting in the space. And unlike coworkers at work, so the people that you're living with, they often don't have the context of your current levels of engagement. And they often interrupt at, or interrupt at inopportune moments. So which means that sometimes you just can't ignore those interruptions. And then you have to basically suspend the task that you're doing often at an inopportune time. And then you have to go and attend to the other task, then come back and then you have enormous difficulty in resuming what you were doing. And then imagine that in you're in a collaborative scenario, someone else comes and interrupts you at home and then you have to go do something else, you come back and then it's also disruptive to the other people who you are collaborating with. So we did a survey recently and so our goal was to try to understand how people were dealing uh, with, uh, with managing tasks now that they're at home. And so one thing that we found, and this is maybe something that also resonates with you as well is that, everyone is interleaving their personal and family responsibilities and their work. 
So we found that regardless of whether people have caregiving responsibilities or not, work is sipping into their personal time and personal work is sipping into their uh, their work time. And this is in particular, uh, this was very apparent for people who do have caregiving responsibilities. The other thing that was also interesting is that on the flip side, there's also people, as some of you already talked about, is that people are feeling lonely and they feel that they're isolated. We don't have our regular kind of cohort of people that we work with or we, we go to school with and we have classes with and we interact with, collaborate with. We don't have that cohort that we're seeing in person anymore. And that takes a toll on your well-being so that in, in turn, it impacts your productivity. So uh, I wanted to kind of like present micro tasks as a way of kind of like thinking about, well, since we're interleaving so much, can we leverage micro tasks even more than ever before? And before that, I wanted to explain what I mean by micro tasks. So the idea of micro tasks has its root in psychology and literature. And the definition that I typically use comes from Newton and Enquist. These are perceptual units of behavior. So if you take a bigger task and you keep on decomposing decomposing the task, then you end up with a set of kind of like very basic level tasks. And these are the micro tasks. So they combine together to make some sub goal and the sub goals combine together to make some, uh, some bigger sub goal and eventually you get to the, the main goal of that task. And so I, I have a couple of very kind of basic examples that you could take writing a paper and you could break it down into writing the different parts and then different parts even have like different sub parts and so on and so forth. So micro productivity is basically taking the, the larger task and the transforming it into a set of smaller micro tasks. So it's, it's kind of like the wrapper around your micro, micro tasks. So there's also, I mean, clearly there's a connection between multitasking and microtasking. So multitasking typically occurs when you're switching attention between mul multiple tasks of interest. Uh, and what is happening with micro tasks is that these tasks are small and you're rapidly switching, but you are also completing each micro task before you're switching to the other one. So multitasking doesn't necessarily mean that you're finishing one task and then switching to another one, where micro tasks are so small that you finish one, switch to the other one. And what would really help with micro tasks and help with the task switching is that if these tasks are context-free, so you don't need much context to do one task so that you can really switch back and forth. So the other thing which is good about microtasking in the context of multitasking is that one of the core issues with multitasking is that difficulties in resuming the task once you get interrupted. And as I said, microtasks are so small that you can essentially finish them before you switch to something else. And so that's why it's, it's kind of like a good way if you want to multitask, break things down into smaller tasks so that you can easily switch back and forth. So, I mean, in today's world, we are already microtasking. Uh, we, when we're on the go, we check, email. we check email, we uh, do communications, we maybe take care of our to-do list, we can do quick browsing, or, or we can do social media, we play games. Uh, but we don't necessarily find micro moments to be really useful in terms of doing complex tasks. So for example, I want to write a document or I want to prepare this presentation or I want to do coding. I mean, we don't think of any of those tasks to be micro tasks though. And uh, basically complex tasks, we feel that we need to set aside focus time. We need to kind of like then double down and get things done and then move on to the next thing. So, uh, and that's, that's, what, that's the challenge that we took on is that we wanted to see that can we take a complex task and micro, turn it into micro tasks and what is the quality of the, of the overall uh, task performance if we do things that way. So now the, the question is that, well, who micro tasks? Um, I think that if you think about crowd workers, the, they are the people that we essentially think about, the people who do the most micro tasks. And they're, they're generally doing unit tasks that can be completed without requiring very little context and oftentimes these tasks are, tasks are also repetitive. Uh, automation can also be uh, one kind of like goal of my, or one, I shouldn't say people, but one way of getting micro tasks done. So you could identify parts of a task that can be automated uh, and that, that part can be kind of like sent, sent to automation in, in terms of getting things done. And then there's also self-sourcing is basically, I could decide that this is a small task that I don't want to do right now. I can defer it to myself or send it to myself or my future self 
and then I can do it later. So uh, let's dig deeper on how you can self-source your own tasks. And again, if you think about it, many of us are doing this already. So oftentimes think about you are writing a document, you want to put in a citation. Now you're in flow when you're write, writing it, so you don't want to interrupt yourself and go look for the citation because that breaks the flow and it kind of like takes you down that disruption path. So instead, maybe you just create an inline note inside it. I mean, sometimes in the document, sometimes as a comment that reminds you later to come back to that task. And so that, that, that way you're creating a micro task for yourself. I mean, there, there are other tasks that you can quickly do rapidly without requiring much context. Sometimes these are communication tasks, sometimes these are other tasks, maybe is on sending me a task to do and I can quickly do it in a few seconds. I don't need a lot of context to do it. Uh, so there, there are those type of things that you can also self-source. And so one of the key things is thinking about, well, how do we do these? And especially in the context of, of, of a day. So there, there are two ways. So if you think that, well, there, there is a beginning of a day and an end of a day, there are micro moments. There are two types of micro moments. And I would say, though, in the current context, maybe there's only one type. Uh, so there are micro moments where you have access to a bigger device. So you you actually have a lot of resources at your disposal. The only thing that you don't have is a lot of time. So say, say that I'm waiting for a meeting to start. And so maybe it's five minutes late, maybe it's two minutes late. I can quickly do stuff because I have my entire desktop or laptop at my disposal. The other type is that, well, I'm on the go. So maybe I'm at my son's basketball game and I really don't have a laptop with me. That would be bad. Uh, but I do have my mobile device and I can actually get a couple of things knocked off while I'm waiting for that game to start. And so in one, in one scenario, it's just the limited attention. Uh, and the other scenario, it's limited attention plus limited screen real estate. And so that's why the microcasts have to adapt to what kind of resources you have available. Um, I was going to say that, I, I don't know whether you can hear the vacuum cleaner running in the background. So that's kind of like, despite all the warnings that you give everyone, people don't have the context. And so I'm, I'm guessing something happened in the other, but I'm not gonna pay attention to that. Uh, but what I want to do is that I'm gonna quickly run through some of the projects uh, that we did around micro productivity at Microsoft and kind of like how we built up the, the, the this uh, area. So um, in, in terms of kind of like with the challenges, so there, there were a few challenges when we first started kind of like uh, uh, broadening the scope of this idea around micro, micro productivity and micro tasking. And so first of all is that, well, who creates micro tasks? How do you create micro tasks uh, once you create them? So how are they presented? Because right now all of our tools are around focused tasking. So if you think about the word processing uh, tools the, the, or ed ed editing tools, the, the uh, uh, presentation tools or coding tools, all of them are around the notion that you have focused time and you will be able to spend time to get things done on these tools. And so presentation of micro tasks was going to be important. Um, in terms of guess, getting assistance, so is it something that just a person does themselves? So can we incorporate collaborators, crowd workers, automation? And then what does it actually mean in terms of task performance? So for example, if I do maybe say half of my tasks using micro tasks and the other half using focus tasks. So what is the overall task performance? How do they, so how does it fit into the broader goal? So if I'm writing a document on my phone using micro tasks, does it actually turn into something that is, that is good in quality or comparable in quality if we are, if we were uh, writing on, on the desktop? So this is, this is a slide, I'm not going to go into the detail uh, in this, but this is kind of like the overview. And so we wanted to start off with writing. And so the first step was that we want to understand the domain. We want to create content, uh, edit content and workflow creation. So uh, I should have actually taken out this slide. Uh, but we, when we thought about uh, micro productivity, and so we picked the writing domain, and there were there were a few reasons. So one is that writing isn't something that you necessarily think is is something that you want to do in short bursts of time via micro tasks. But if you think about writing, there are actually many micro tasks that are embedded within writing. Um, we typically think that writing needs focused attention task. And so we wanted to challenge that notion a little bit. And we wanted to see that, well, can we produce content out of con Canvas? So by Canvas, I mean the, the word processing editor. Can we produce content 
uh, in even potentially challenging environments. So for example, when you're on the go and what is the quality of the content? So these were the key research questions that we were interested in. So uh, we first started off that, well, we want to create content from scratch. And the original goal that we started off with is that we want to write a research paper entirely using micro tasks. And towards that goal, the first step is that, well, what are, what are these steps? And so we, we borrowed a little uh, from uh, Michael Bernstein's find, fix, verify uh, paradigm. And so we wanted to kind of like translate that into micro test writing in terms, in terms of first collect the content. So get a bunch of ideas. And that's something that you can quickly jot down in a few seconds. You can kind of like type it. Uh, if you're a good phone typer, you can type it in your phone. You could type it in your desktop, but it's no, it, it doesn't require any, any kind of like time commitments. And then, then the second one is that, well, you have collected a bunch of ideas, you now need to organize them. So you organize the ideas that you have collected into a, a, a discrete set of themes. And then once you have kind of categorized those ideas into themes, now you take each theme and then you add a couple of sentences around it. So this is kind of like where you create this, I would say enhanced outline. Now the last step is where you actually do the organization. You make sure that it's flowing well and all of those things. And that's not something that we thought that we were going to be able to do via microtest. That's something that you need to go back to your desktop and you need some focus time for it. So, so that that was that was an in interesting interesting project. We uh, we evaluated this in the context of collaborative writing, where a bunch of people got together in a room and they all kind of like did some group brainstorming, jotted an idea. They and and they were able to produce some content in a very little time. And then they spent the rest of the time kind of like uh, finalizing that content in in a more focused way. The other other, other uh, project that explored micro productivity was okay. Can we can we now write from a what? And so that doesn't necessarily mean that you're typing from the what, but the author is actually managing the, uh, the coordination of writing from a what. So there's a bunch of crowd workers who are given instructions to kind of like gather content and expand on the content. And they're all writing it in, in, a, in a Google Doc, but all the co coordination of what needs to be written, any questions that the crowd workers might have is done through the what. And so this is another way where the author who is not necessarily adding content themselves they are overseeing the writing process and this is happening through happening through a, through a watch so those two projects were more about content uh, creation and uh, from scratch and the next projects that I'm going to talk about are more about okay so we have the con content that was created on say a Google Doc or Word or whatever uh, but now you want to start editing that content so we created this tool called Playwright, which essentially it analyzes your Word document, it creates micro tasks and uploads them to the cloud. And then you can see these micro tasks on your mobile phone. And this is kind of like presented in a game-like way. So the idea was that, well, I'm, I play Angry Birds uh, and that takes up my time. So maybe if we kind of like disguise the tasks as a game, people might be more inclined to just run through a few tasks in their few moments without feeling that they're getting engaged in work and without feeling that they're actually doing work. And then the changes get automatically reflected back into the document. And so, so th th this, was a, this was a fun project. And I think that from my point of view, whenever I would see those changes magically come back into the document, that was kind of like the fulfilling moment for me. Uh, there, so the tasks that we had implemented here were actually basic copy editing kind of tasks. We didn't go into something too uh, complex. It was changing, uh, changing grammatical uh, uh, structure, uh, fixing spellings, accepting or rejecting comments, uh, or accepting, rejecting changes, uh, the, replying to comments or, or deleting comments and things like that. Um, and our evaluation showed that people did appreciate doing some of these kind of like low attention tasks on the go, but they also wanted to define their own micro tasks, which was not something that Playwright did, but we tested out in the, in the next project. And so what we wanted to do is that we wanted to give people the opportunity to now create their own microtask. So it's not an engine that is running in the background and picking out the microtask. We are telling people that, okay, so here's your system. You can create this on your own microtask. You define what, what microtasks are being created, and then you can complete them on the go. And then finally, 
we wanted to see what the quality of the document is if people do that. So there, there are a few questions that we had here. So one is that we wanted to see what are the types of microtasks people create themselves because they have the context, they know when they're going to complete them. And so they know what tasks they can complete on the go and what tasks they cannot. And so we were interested in that space. Uh, we wanted to see when people address these microtasks, and then we wanted to see when the microtasks got integrated back into the document, did people find it easier to get engaged with the document again? And so this is a this is a paper that's going to be presented at uh, Mobile HCI next week, uh, and we did this work back uh, last summer. Uh, what we found is that when people create their own microtasks, they're very cognizant about the types of tasks that they're creating. So they would not create a microtask where they would have to write out a paragraph or reorganize a paragraph. They would add microtasks around where it's easy information insertion, something that they could search and then add in later, something that they can do on a phone. Uh, something that doesn't require a lot of context, uh, something so information valid, uh, verification and things like that. And we also found that when people were people were doing these micro tasks when they were mostly on the go, a lot of people did it during their bus commutes. Uh, a lot of people, uh, some people said that they did it between meetings. Uh, we also compared this with having asking people to edit their whole document or having access to the whole document in mobile word. And one of the things that we were interested in is in doing the micro tasks, did people feel the need to actually see the whole document? And for most of the micro tasks that people themselves created, I think that they opened the document only once or twice. Uh, so it wasn't, they were, when they were creating the micro tasks, they, they just assumed that they wouldn't have access to the document. So. So, so, and, and uh, at the end, what we found is that when people are engaging with the document via microtask outside of the, the desktop document, it was easier for them to ramp back up. So when they came back, they were easy. The document length increased uh, quite a bit. I think that content wise, people, people felt more comfortable editing the final product where for the Word people, the group who were just using Microsoft Word, they didn't really have much to add once they, once they had finished the microtask. We also wanted to see, well, microtasks, given that they're uh, intentionally, they're not designed to be super engaging. So what happens if we start kind of like uh, flipping the, the distraction part? And so we start presenting microtasks in people's social media feeds. And it, oops, it wasn't because we wanted to ruin social media for people, but we were curious to see that, well, if microtasks show up in social media, one, do people get engaged? Two, is that uh, kind of like serve as a subtle reminder for people to get back to work? What we found is that one, people for the first two and a half minutes, I mean, let's putting aside some people who would be on social media for a long time, but for most people for two and a half minutes, they could completely ignore all these micro tests. And then once they had that kind of like gotten through their initial initial uh, pressing of the uh, social media environment, then they would uh, slowly start getting engaged with some of the micro tasks. And in 20% of the cases, we found that that encouraged people to actually go and open the document and start working. So there were, there were two purposes being served here. One is that it helped people ramp up uh, to doing more complex editing or more focused editing. The other one was that people did say is that, I mean, I don't necessarily want to edit the document that I am deeply engaged with. Sometimes I go to Facebook because I want to be away from the document. But if you show me a different document that I haven't engaged with in a while, this might be a good way for me to kind of like just keep that alive and refreshed in my mind. And so they didn't really necessarily want to get engaged with all the documents, but this kept them, at least it kept the content fresh for them. Uh, the ne next topic looked at how we could incorporate the crowd. And so this is where you could just take parts of a document. And so this is more from the copy editing point of view. And you could take parts of a document and ask people to quickly rate the whether the document is or, or the, the snippet of the text is uh, has spelling or grammatical errors and uh, whether or not they, they felt a certain text read well uh, and, and what the, people could give it a thumbs up or thumbs down. And then you could uh, combine responses from multiple cloud workers and kind of like show it in a visual, it, it's, it's a easily discernible way visually that people could see either green, which meant that it was really good or, or a mixture of different other colors that would suggest that, okay, this part of the document needs some work. Um, let's see. 
project that we did, I wanted to quickly touch upon this. So we wanted to see how content that we capture while mobile and how easily having it easily integrated into your Word document actually helps with, with, uh, with the overall content usage. So imagine you have your mobile phone, you're in a meeting, you want to quickly take a, a take a photo of the whiteboard uh, so that you can kind of like take your notes later. You are you are walking around and you see a you see a scenario or you see a kind of like sign that you want to take a picture of so that you can use it in a PowerPoint presentation later. Uh, so there there or you want to capture a voice note or you want to take a quick note. Uh, we can do all of these things now. The problem is that these are all residing in separate silos. So when we want to reuse them, finding them becomes becomes challenging because they are residing in either your photos folder or your notes folder. And if you want to use it in a document or in a in a, a slide deck, then you have to go to those separate places, and that itself is a distraction. So we wanted to see is that if we could connect them all through a framework. So I do the capture, I can even add context to it later. So maybe I do a capture of a whiteboard and I quickly, automatically it captures the context that, well, this was during this meeting, on this day, uh, these were the other people who are present at the meeting. So there's automatically some capture that we can be, uh, uh, that that can be added to that captured content. Then you could also even add more context yourself that this is the reason why I captured this photo. Uh, you could connect it to, or you uh, you could associate it with a particular document. So when you open the document, everything that you captured showed up shows up on a sidebar. So the benefit of this is that instead of having to go to different places to get that different pieces of information, everything that you captured is in a sidebar. So it helps with your flow as well when you're writing. So if I'm writing and I have to switch the app and go to something else, I have already created a distraction and disruption. But if it's in my sidebar, I can quickly grab it and or I can quickly decide that, well, I need this or I don't need this. So this was what this work was looking at, is that microtasks and flow, how can those two things go together? And also bringing in the, the mobile side of things is that you're capturing these content, which is very low attention, but when you want to use it, how can we make it uh, smoother? So the other this this piece of work, and so this is what I was talking about before, is that you could use microtasks to build context. And so what we did in this work is that we wanted to see whether presenting different types of microtasks or the same type of microtasks for different types of content. So you could imagine that just like a crowd worker, uh, you are doing a bunch of spelling corrections and people gain speed on that pretty quickly, but it doesn't necessarily help them build context around the text itself. But you could imagine that you start off with a very easy, small, uh, easy micro task, and then you start giving people more difficult micro tasks around the same content. So say you have a paragraph in a in a document, you first give them a very easy spell correction micro task, and then maybe you give them a micro task where they have to uh, reorganize a sentence, and they are now already building some context about this about the text because they are doing multi multiple micro tasks on the same text. And so what this helps them with is that when they start editing on, on the, uh, or when they start doing more focused editing, they now have already built the context and it's easy for them to get engaged. Uh, and so, so, so the, the, this, this was quite interesting in the sense is that uh, it helped with the ramp up and ramp down idea is that, and then also when you're ramping down, you could imagine that, okay, so towards the end, you start doing some easier tasks so that you can slowly ramp out of, of, of the editing part. Uh, similarly, we wanted to see how we could build context for the crowd. And so one of the issues when you want to have crowd workers do work for you, and especially a bit more complex tasks than just labeling or, or correction of things, uh, there is a lot of back and forth that needs to happen between the requester and the crowd member. And so we wanted to kind of like reduce this, this uh, uh, back and forth. And so what we looked at is that can we, can we set up the original request in a way that most of the question, anticipating most of the questions that a crowd worker might uh, have, and then also having a middle person, so another crowd worker who would be acting as the intermediary, and they would they would create the, the instructions for the uh, crowd workers who are actually creating the content. Uh, this work was uh, talking about the workflow. So everything else was about uh, how you can use microtasks for different populations, but this one was creating, how do you create the microtasks? So if you have a complex writing task, and so what is the way that 
can you just like feed it into an engine you f you give them a bigger task you feed it into an engine and then it spits out a, a series of micro tasks so that was kind of the idea so what we did here is that we explored how this could be made possible uh, so what we came up with the idea is that well maybe we create a vocabulary of these unit tasks and the way that they would be created that these these unit tasks would be then uh, mix and match in different ways to help you achieve a broader sub goal uh, so we looked at a bunch of wikipedia articles that were in the c class i think and that were kind of like in, in still being edited and as well as a bunch of documents within microsoft that had comments in them and so these comments typically had some kind of instruction or task to be done and then we broke those tasks into kind of like uh, multiple micro tasks and eventually we came up with a vocabulary that had i think uh 18 uh unit tasks and then we, we we did another study where we wanted to see how these unit tasks could be used to kind of like come up with different types or you, these unit tasks could be used to address the comments uh, that existed in that document so what we found is that there there was about 20 to 25 percent of the unit tasks that could be automated so that means that you could once you break down a task then you identify these are things that I have to do it as my as the author no one else can do it these are the parts that maybe a colleague can do or a crowd worker can do and these are the parts that can be automated and so then essentially you're breaking it down so that you're leaving the things that you are good at for yourself and then you are you are kind of like sending out the stuff that are that are being uh uh that other people can do for you and so you're you, you're basically saving some cycles for yourself um so this is the work that I wanted to talk about because I think that this um, really touches upon productivity and well-being and this uh, a little bit of this motivation came from ramping up and ramping down so we have talked about ramping up to writing something and ramping down from writing and so this was work that we did back in 2017 and we were thinking that well can we do something uh, at the beginning of the day when typically what we found in our log analysis is that people were doing a lot of kind of like planning for the day as they came into work and the first hour or first half hour was spent kind of like replying to emails kind of like thinking out what the day we should look like and at the end of the day people typically don't kind of like they they don't ramp down they just leave work and they go home with lingering thoughts of work in their head and they're essentially not present at home because they're still th thinking about work. Mm -hmm. And we want to kind of like think about, okay, so we have a commute uh, that people are typically, that is the physical separation between your home and your work life. Mm -hmm. And can we use that commute time to actually help people transition from home to work? And that was partly motivated by my own experience as well as that I had about a 25 minute commute in the morning, which was time that I actually had to myself and I could think, but I didn't really have a way to capture those thoughts. And so I could essentially, I had 25 minutes where I could start getting ramped up for work, but because I didn't have a capability, I didn't really have the tools to do so because I was driving as well. Uh, so we then thought that, well, maybe we could have this kind of like assistance based experience and we used a chatbot for that and we didn't do the study in, in, in a car but we did it as people were walking into work and as people left work um, we did uh, analysis of organizational health uh, behavior and occupational health psychology to understand what helps people design with disengaging from work and getting reengaged. and one of the things that we found that your productivity would be sustained more if you're actually adequately disengaged from work and same way, if you help people plan at the beginning of the day, that helps them be more, more productive throughout the day. So we wanted to see if that, well, we create this bot that helps people just disengage and re-engage. How does that impact their productivity and uh, well-being in some sense? And so we, we came up with just two super simple questions. And that's why I really like this work is that it was so simple that it was almost to the point of that, okay, how, how come no one thought of this before? And I think that, it, again, many people are already doing this. This kind of like just put some form, formal frame, framing around it. So we had two types of questions that we tested. One was a task-based reflection at the end of the day. What did you do today? And uh, what do you want to work on tomorrow? And then the other one was more emotion or reflection based. How did you feel about work today? And how do you want to feel about work tomorrow? So it's kind of like living in that little hope that, well, the, the bot is capturing what you want to feel about tomorrow. And when people talk about their feelings, 
that automatically captures what their workday was like. But when you have the task-based approach, people are thinking in very kind of the task-centric ways that, okay, I, I, I addressed uh, two bugs or I, I went to three meetings or I finished this paper and things like that, but they don't necessarily reflect on how they feel about it. And so that was key because what we found is that people who did the emotion-based reflection, they had more sustained productivity throughout the day and they felt better about themselves. Uh, and and, and uh, the parallel to this is that when they would walk into work, the bot would remind them about what they had said before and say that, well, yesterday you said that you wanted to feel like this. Is it still the plan today? What is the first step in feeling that? So note that it's not making you fill out a big to-do list. It's just helping you get engaged with a small goal. What is the first step that, that you want to take? And the task based one was also very similar. Yesterday you said that you wanted to do this and then uh, what is the first step in, in doing that? And so, so what it does, this work does here is that it's creating this ritual around ramping up to work and ramping down. And so what we found is that when people did this exercise, they were more productive in the first hour, but also for the emotion based reflection, they were more productive throughout the day. We also found that when people detached, uh, they were really not engaging with at least the Microsoft tools from home. So because we, we have my analytics that helps us kind of like understand whether people are sending our after our emails and whatnot. So we saw that people were engaging with those less. Now, there is a caveat here is that we didn't really have good measures of how people were disengaged at home because partly we didn't want to uh, ask them questions about whether they were disengaged and then kind of like create this rippling effect where they start thinking about work again. Uh, but I mean, if we wanted to build on this work, we would probably have them wear sensors and whatnot and true just to get a sense of whether they were actually relaxed at home. And so this work eventually, it, it is uh, being, uh, it, it's, it's actually been folded into a product that is coming out soon called Virtual Commute. So which makes me very happy because it, it was three years ago when we did this. It, it wasn't planned for something like a pandemic clearly, but I think that the Virtual Commute is geared towards kind of like virtually setting that transition space. And when I say space, it's kind of like this mental space where you want to transition between your home life and your work life at the beginning of the day and the end of the day. Now, again, the caveat here is that for many of us, there's really no transition, but at least it at the beginning of the day, it puts you in that framing that, okay, I am moving from purely home-based thoughts to work-based thoughts. And that might look different for different people. It's still for people like me, I, I have to switch back and forth to help my kids with learning and whatnot. But for others, it could be that, well, they really have time to focus and that that routine helps them with kind of making that mental transition. And similarly, at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, so this one was about microtask programming, and I'm not going to go into detail on this. And I know that we have four minutes, so maybe I shouldn't touch on this at all. But this was where we extracted tasks from programming that could be done via uh, when you're on the go. And so this was mostly what we found is that people could do either some kind of like uh, exploration of uh, 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 related material or it could be some kind of like unit testing that they could quickly do and once they those results getting integrated back into their programming environment they actually made them feel that they had made progress while they were still on the go uh, yeah the, the the final one it's kind of like okay so with this fun project thinking about can we do micro tasks while we are driving and this is a driving simulator we did the study just saying giving people a route to drive on using the driving simulator and we asked them to create content using just micro tasks there were there were a few issues that came out here is that we wanted the micro tasks to be as context free as possible but reality is that when you are doing something like this people automatically start building context and that starts interfering with their driving um, so, so there were there were some things that people were able to do, and some other things I think that, especially when they were creating a slide deck via voice, via microtask, that became difficult because people just started visualizing, and that that started interfering with their with their driving. Um, some future directions we have been thinking about how we can kind of like start serving these microtasks. So I would imagine that well, if if we had this tool. Uh, 
during the pandemic, I would really like to have it tell me what to do next, that I have two minutes or three minutes, and this is the thing that you should be doing. Uh, we, are, we are currently starting to work on this, uh, and so we'll see where we get, get with it.